Next up, we have Rich Brooks here to present on building a digital marketing plan. First, let me introduce Rich. Rich has a focus on digital marketing strategies. He helps businesses in Maine and beyond reach more of their ideal customers through effective websites, social media, and content marketing. Please help me in welcoming Rich. So I'll, I'll just jump in because I have so much content to share with you. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Perfect. All right, then let's jump into this because um, I've done this presentation in for 30 minutes and I've done this presentation as an all day event. I'm not even sure which slide deck I brought here. So there's just going to be a lot of good stuff. And I still would love to try and answer some questions when we're all done. I've been at this for over 23 years. I've worked on hundreds of digital marketing plans and all the successful ones start with a concrete plan, a concrete written plan, something in writing. So today my framework is gonna be about helping you develop that plan for your business. This should be a perfect addition to your small business academy experience and all the stuff that Shannon's been sharing with you and will continue to share with you. So, so much of marketing is really understanding the customer journey and where you can meet them along the road. Now, all COVID did is just speed up the migration of the customer journey to digital, but it definitely was heading that way anyways. And I mentioned this in the breakout group earlier. It's like, I know that people want things to get back to normal, but you need to be aware it's never going to get back to the way it used to be pre-COVID. Things are going to change. New skills from your customers have been developed. And, and just as a side note or a, a way of explaining this, my mom is retired. She's in her mid-70s, but she's teaching a class or was teaching a class at Brandeis for the adult ed group called Bali there, all about mysteries. And then COVID hits, right? And all of a sudden they're Brandeis didn't want to give the money back to all their students. So they said, we're going online and all the instructors will learn how to use Zoom. My mother had never used Zoom. She wanted to keep teaching though. So she met with IT and learned how to teach a course on Zoom and finished up the semester. And I was talking to her the other day and she says, not only did she finish the semester, she's teaching another course via Zoom. The average age or the ages of the students that she's teaching to are 63 or 60 years old to 93 years old. None of those people had used Zoom before. Most of them had no idea how to do it and they all continued learning and they're actually teaching more classes in different classes than they ever did before. Your customers have learned how to shop online. They've learned how to do their research online. They've learned and become more comfortable with everything online. So you need to be there on their customer journey. So that's why we're gonna focus on how to develop that digital marketing plan. I'm going to make my slides available. I do go fairly quickly because I want to be able to answer some questions for you as time goes on. So today, here's what I want to be able to do. I want to share something called the bare essentials of digital marketing formula with you. I want to give you the tools and tricks to develop your own plan and the tools, to, uh, tips and tactics so that you can succeed. So I mentioned this bare essentials, this bare essentials of digital marketing. This is a, a framework that we use at Flight to work with our clients. And it's an acronym, BEAR is. And the B is for built, or how do you build a platform, a website that turns visitors into customers? The A is for attract, about how do we get them there in the first place? The R is for retain. How do we stay in touch with them after they've left your site? And the E is for evaluate. What should we measure so that we know that what we're doing is working or that it's not working and we need to change directions. I got a nice little introduction, so I'll go through this quickly. My name is Rich Brooks. I'm the president of Flight New Media, a digital agency located in Portland, Maine. I also founded the Agents of Change. This is a weekly podcast and an annual conference, usually, uh, where we bring in some of the best digital marketers from around the country to either come on the show or present live in Portland. We've been doing that since 2012. I'm also the tech guru on 207, where I do hard hitting news stories on like where the best recipe sites are online and how to take better pictures with your smartphone. Hardcore journalism. I also wrote a book called The Lead Machine, The Small Business Guide to Digital Marketing, which you can pick up at a few select bookstores around Maine, but of course on Amazon as well. 
And most recently, I co-founded with uh, Yuri Nabokov, Fast Forward Maine. So it's kind of a partnership between Flight and Machaya Savings Bank. And it's a resource for growing Maine businesses. It's a podcast and at times in-person events, but these days, of course, webinars. So as you can see, this is my playground and I love to play in it. I love digital and I love working with a wide variety of different businesses. Now, speaking of Fast Forward Maine, in a recent episode, we interviewed Gigi Guyton from SCORE on business plans. And she shared with us that the most challenging part can be the marketing section for most entrepreneurs. Business plans are essential if you're the owner and if you're going to an outside party to help fund your business, like a bank or friends and family, or if you're just trying to develop a plan you can follow yourself. They're also essential if you're an internal marketer or a business consultant to show the owner how she can succeed. So coming up with a plan, whenever we have a new client, we always take them through this process. So I wanna share it with you, the questions that we ask and that you need to ask yourself. What do you offer or how do you describe your business? In very simple elevator pitch sort of terms, what are you bringing to the marketplace? What are your top three business goals or objectives? They could be for this campaign or in general. Who is your ideal customer? I once asked this question of a restaurateur and he said, anybody that needs to eat to survive. Clever, maybe. But he had a mid-range Mexican restaurant near the mall. Rather than try and go after everybody who needs to eat to, to survive, if he had focused his attention on families that like that type of experience or people who had just visited the mall or people within five miles from him, he probably would have had a much more successful business. It's okay that if you sell things outside of your ideal customer base, but you should really figure out who is the perfect person to buy from you and focus on that one person or those different people if there's more than one group. Determine what they want from your website. Do they want information? Do they want to buy? Do they want to know how to get to your store? Do they need information to make a buying decision? Who are your biggest three competitors? And not just the ones that you know of, but go to Google and start searching for the kind of things that you have to offer. Who beat you at Google? Because those are your competitors too, especially when we think online. And this is the most important question perhaps. How do you differentiate yourself? It's okay if you're the cheapest or the most expensive, if you're the easiest to get to or the most exclusive. Whatever makes you you, you really need to amplify and make sure that's all part of your marketing message online and off. So I mentioned the bare essentials. That's also gonna be the framework for the content that I'm gonna share with you today. So the B is for build, so let's jump into your website. One of the first things that you should think about when building or rebuilding your website is how the site is going to be organized. <clears throat> One thing that you wanna make sure that you do, and whenever we sit down with a client, we always go through this process, is we make sure that we understand what they're offering, what are their products or services. Every page, or every offering rather, gets its own page. We really wanna narrow that focus and have a page that's really focused on that one thing that you do. Keep in mind that people navigate differently. You're always gonna want that navigation bar at the top of your page uh, that lets people jump to the important parts of your website. But keep in mind that some people might come in, they might wanna look for specific products or services, but other people are gonna self-identify and instead look for the thing that looks like them. Like if they're, if they're a, if you're the parent teachers association, some people like I'm a parent, I'm gonna to go to the parents section. Some people are gonna be teachers, they're gonna to go to the teacher section. Whatever you do, make sure that it's easy for different types of people to get to different parts of your site. And also always take a look at your competitors. And the reason I say this is because if all your competitors are using a certain phrase uh, in their website, like a section of their website, then you need to consider if you should use that same language as they do. Sometimes that's a good idea because you wanna make sure that when people are comparing you to your competition, they can compare apples to apples. But other times you may decide that because everybody's doing one thing, you may want to take a different approach, but it's good to understand how your competition is organizing their own website. Now your website's role in your digital marketing plan is critical because I don't care how many fans you have on Facebook. I don't care how adorable you are on Instagram or how many people repin you on Pinterest. If your website isn't effective, everything falls apart. Your website should be built to move people down the sales funnel. 
Different businesses are gonna have different objectives. Maybe it's about credibility or brand building, or maybe it's about turning visitors into prospects or prospects into customers and clients. Maybe you need to get the phone ringing or get people to fill out your contact form, get people to join your community, to join your cause, to book a room, a flight, a tour, whatever you need to do, that's your website's goal. It's your sales and marketing team on the clock 24 seven. So you need to consider during that customer journey, what are the things that are gonna get people to move forward? And what are the things that are gonna hold them back? What are the points of friction that we need to remove? One of the first things that you need to do is to build trust. I'm sure you've all heard about know, like, and trust. People like doing business, people they know, like, and trust. Trust in the real world takes time, days, weeks, years even. However, the attention span for the average person on your website is about that of a tsetse fly. So we're gonna need what we might call some trust hacks, ways that we kind of break down quickly those barriers to trust. One of my favorite books in marketing is called Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion by Dr. Robert Cialdini. I just read it, I think for the third or fourth time now. It's a fantastic read for anybody interested in marketing. In it, he identifies what he calls the six weapons of influence. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but a couple of them are very important for this conversation. And one is authority. Even in this day and age, we look to symbols of authority to help us understand what we're supposed to do. The sheriff's badge tells us that this is a position of authority. And we're hopefully gonna to listen to a sheriff he tells us what to do. So how does this work for your website? Well, you can put badges on your website too. So in this case, this is a, uh, uh, this is a landscaper and they, on their website, they're showing that they've been featured in the Uptown News, the San Diego Home and Garden and Fine Magazine. These are their badges. Your badges of credibility that immediately build trust might be Chamber of Commerce. It might be uh, a certification that you've earned, whatever it may be, some organization that you belong to. All those can be considered badges of authority and consider putting them on your website in appropriate places to help build that trust. Another weapon of influence is social proof. We are social creatures and we look to others for tips on how we should be behaving. Now I use this image right here because if you've ever been with a group of people and you all look up on a city corner, everybody who passes you has to look up. It's just part of what human nature is all about. So how can you use this on your website in your marketing? Well, the most obvious example is testimonials. Here's a testimonial, great job from Brooke F. in Durham, New Hampshire. Okay, that's not bad, but really who's this Brooke F.? I don't even know, is this a real person or not? A better approach might be to use photographs of your customers, obviously with their permission, where they talk in a little bit more depth of what you're doing. And these obviously could be stock photography, but we're guessing that they're not, that these are real people that, that this company helped out. And what's even more powerful than photos these days is video. If you can get your customers, your happy customers on video, then when I come to your website and I see, wow, that customer was in the same position I am in and they took a risk and they chose you and it worked out great for them. Well, then that's going to lower the feeling of risk that I have when I come to your website. So think about the kind of testimonials that you can gather for your site and, and don't bother putting them all on one page. Nobody cares about testimonials enough to go to the testimonials page, but if you sprinkle them throughout your website, that can be incredibly important. Another important thing in building trust, not one of the weapons of influence, but another one is appearance. And there's a famous PR expert by the name of Michael Levine, and he came up with what's called the Tiffany Box Theory. And the Tiffany Box Theory just simply states that anything delivered in a Tiffany box has a higher perceived value than something in a plain paper box or no box whatsoever. So again, the design of your website, the look and feel of your website is critically important. People judge you by the way you look and they judge your website by the way it looks. I'm not saying that you necessarily have to have a Tiffany box website because quite honestly, you know, if you have a greasy spoon diner, then you should be not showing photos of white linens. You should be showing the best photos of a greasy spoon diner from your greasy spoon diner that you possibly can. You just wanna put yourself in the best position possible. Now, obviously design is like beauty in that it's in the eye of the beholder. What I think is a good looking website may not be what you think is a good looking website, but it's all about building that trust. 
this, I was doing some research for a client in, in the senior living space. And this was after seeing a bunch of really low to medium quality sites, I stumbled upon this one. And I'm like, this is a nice looking site. I see this building, this is beautiful. Maybe my parents would like to retire there, whatever the case is. But I also like this because right when I, excuse me, right when I get to the site, they immediately say some keywords, let us guide you. They're the experts, right? So then they say, are you here for yourself, a loved one, or a new career? Those are the three audiences that they're serving. And once I click on one of those links, then I'm taking to a conversation that's more specific for my needs. So also think about that as you're building out your homepage and some of the other key pages on your site. Now, we're not talking about marketing brochures online anymore. We want something that's interactive and we want to get people to take action. So what kind of things get people to take action? Well, I've talked to a lot of small businesses that want to get the phone ringing and I'm like, well, where's your phone number on your website? And they're like, oh, it's on the contact page. It should be at the top right corner of every single page on your website. And it should be a clickable link so that if people are visiting your website on a smartphone, they can just click that link and suddenly they're going to be talking to you. You should have a contact form and not an email address. Contact forms are so much better. First of all, they're more professional looking. You can gather all the information you need from them. And also these days, you don't know if someone's showing up on a smartphone or a tablet or a computer, and you don't always know if they click on an email link, what's going to happen next. They're certainly going to be taken off of your website, which you don't want to have happen. But I know that on I use Gmail. If I click on an email link on Safari, basically Safari just kind of goes crazy. It doesn't know what to do with a Gmail link. So now I've been taken out of this. I'm just frustrated and I don't want to do business with you anymore. A contact form gets all the best information, puts it into a CRM automatically for you, a customer relationship management software database. And it can also send you that email. Plus it protects you from people who are scraping emails off the web mm -hmm. so they can send you information about Viagra and Russian brides and Nigerian princes. So take your emails off your website and use a contact form instead. And email opt-ins. I'm gonna talk more about email marketing later, but everybody should be considering an email newsletter to stay in touch with your ideal customers. And no dead ends. Never have a great page that explains everything and they get to the bottom of the page and they don't know what to do. You assume they're gonna go find the contact page, but why not create a link that tells them what the next step is? Years ago, I took ballroom dance. And one of the things I learned when I was doing ballroom dance is that if I make, if I make a mistake, it's my fault. If my partner makes a mistake, it's also my fault. And that's because I'm supposed to give them good frame. I'm supposed to make sure that they can't make a mistake. And that's by giving good frame. On your website, you need to give good frame. So you need to make sure at the bottom of every page and possibly multiple times throughout the page, there's a call to action, like click here for a free consult or click here for a free appointment or whatever it may be, that tells people what the next step is to make their life easier. Now I could talk about websites honestly for another 12 hours, but I know we don't have that kind of time. You don't have that kind of patience. But if you take some of these ideas and you implement them, you're gonna have built a much better mousetrap. So great, now what do you do? Well, this is where attract comes in. So we're gonna try and drive qualified traffic to your website. And there's a lot of ways to do it, but the three digital marketing ways are SEO or search engine optimization, social media, and digital ads. And you need to be aware of how each one fits in. SEO, which also includes local SEO, and digital advertising are great for leads, sales, and conversions. Where, set, where social is better for branding and awareness and that whole know, like, and trust factor. It doesn't drive as much traffic to your website as some of the others do, but it's also equally important for warming up those leads. Now, the bottom line is all those things are basically fall into the category of uh, content marketing and content marketing or creating content costs money. Ads obviously cost money, but creating and promoting content on those free platforms like Facebook or Google or Instagram all require an investment of time, which is money. So you need to determine what are the costs here and is it worth it? So one exercise I like taking people through is trying to figure out what the customer lifetime value is, something most entrepreneurs never bother with, but it's an important, it's a critical thing for your success. What I usually say is what is the net value, not the total value, but the net value of a customer in year one? 
So if you've got a sandwich shop and a customer comes in every week, buys one sub for $10 and you say make $5 off of that sub, five times 52, that is the value of that customer in year one. Then how many years on average does the typical customer stick with you? If that customer usually comes in every week for five years and you can take that number, and I'm not good at math without a calculator, which is why I didn't give you that number, but you multiply those numbers. So you take the net value over one year and you multiply it by the customer years and that's your CLV or your customer lifetime value. It is such an important number for you to understand. At the beginning of your journey as an entrepreneur, it may be guesswork, but you keep on need to refining that. The next thing you need to do is start to measure what percentage of your leads become customers. So if 10 people fill out your contact form and one of them becomes a customer, then you've got a conversion rate of about 10%. So you take your customer lifetime value, you divide it by the lead conversion rate, and now you know how much you can spend on getting a lead, whether it's through a blog post, a podcast, a social media post, or some advertising. I know that's a lot of math. I personally hate math, but I want you to figure that out you know, later on on your own so you start to understand how much money you can spend to acquire a new customer. Now, let's talk a little bit about SEO, which is my favorite part of digital marketing personally. Uh, the bottom line is my experience has been that most of your good traffic, qualified traffic is gonna come through the search engines because SEO search is about discovery. When do we search? when we need something, when we desire something. So when does your ideal customer search? When he or she needs your products or services. When your ideal customer needs you most, that's when they go to Google. So how do you make sure that you show up on Google at the top of page one? Well, it can be very tricky, quite honestly. People have figured out SEO, there's a lot of competition out there, but you need to understand that Google is gonna serve up pages that are relevant to the search that was just done that come from high quality pages and websites and that come from websites with a lot of inbound links, links from other sites to yours. So in my industry, there's something called SERPs, search engine results page. You've seen them if you've ever gone to Google, which I'm sure you all have. And if you printed out the long page, it would look like this, but let's take a closer look at it. So I'm looking for a wedding venue in this example. And you can see the first four results are all ads. So I can't, if I have to scroll down to get to anything that's not an ad. And as I scroll down, the next group of results are in the local pack. So these are all local results because Google figures, first they figured, if I go back here, they first figured I have a commercial intent, right? Intent is important. So Google's like, here's somebody who's gonna rent a wedding venue. So I'm gonna show them ads. And next they're like, well, they probably want something local so here are some local results, because if I wanted something in California, what is it? California wedding venue. So here are the local results and they take up a bunch of space. And then down below that, you'll see it's very competitive. The top two results are from The Knot and Wedding Wire, which are basically like the Amazons of that particular category. So it can be competitive out there. So you need an SEO plan. And what this comes down to is doing some keyword research. And I'm gonna give you some bare bones stuff around that in just a minute creating what we call a keyword matrix, which basically means figuring out what pages you need on your website and what the titles and headers and, and the keywords are gonna be for each page. Coming up with some ideas around content suggestions for either your blog post or your YouTube videos or your podcast. And by the way, I don't expect you to do all of those things, but you decide where you wanna put your energy. It might require some local SEO and it might require some paid search. So that's the challenge for Google is taking a look at all these things. So let's start with doing some keyword research, to which is really just market research, to figure out what our customers, our best customers are searching for in Google. And it's not as complicated as this guy's making it out to be, right? It's in my opinion, it's fairly straightforward. First, you start, you brainstorm. You brainstorm some of your keyword phrases, and I'm gonna give you some tips around that in a second. Next, you test your assumptions with some free or paid software. And lastly, you take that information and you create new, better content that answers your ideal customer's questions when they go to Google. So when I sit down with a client, we start brainstorming keywords. I tell them to think of five perspectives. The first one is the most obvious. What are your products or services? You know, maybe you're a bang or dentist, or maybe you are a, uh, an importer, whatever it is, whatever your products or services, just think of all the different ways that somebody might describe that. 
Next, a lot of people search based on the problem they're suffering from. So what is the problem that your ideal customer suffers from? Maybe there's a bunch of problems. So write those all down. Next, some people actually search on the solutions. So what are all the potential solutions? What are the things that they might get from working for you? And figure those out, put those all in. There's no wrong ideas at this point. Next is features. Now, if you've ever taken a sales course, you know, there's, you never sell on features, you only sell on benefits. But the internet is not quite like that because people have already done their research. And when people are searching for specific features, it means that they're near the end of their customer journey about to make a buying decision and you wanna be in front of those people. So make sure that you put down all your features. And lastly, your competition. And I'm not saying that if you have a burger joint, you put down McDonald's, that could get you into some hot water. I'm saying, what are some of the things that people could do instead of buying from you? Think about that, write those things down. When you've done all that, then you kind of wanna to start to organize these into different categories. Uh, maybe there's some problems and solutions that both talk about the same thing. And once you've done that, then you're ready to start testing this. Now, there are some really high-end software programs that digital agencies have that are fantastic. But there's a free program out there that works almost as well. And it's Google's own Keyword Planner. It's a free program. You do have to sign up for Google Ads to use it, but you don't have to spend any money on Google Ads to use it. Although I'll give you a pro tip that if you spend just a dollar a day on Google Ads, they actually give you a lot more data. So it might be worth just throwing a dollar a day at Google while you're doing this particular research. So here's how it might work. You go to the tool, and in this case, I'm testing out some different variations around fire alarms. So I put in three, and I click on Get Started, and this is what Google feeds me back. This is based on all of their search history. I see near the top in the left-hand column the, the options I put in, but then I see a bunch of related search terms that might be better. And the next column tells me the average monthly searches. So you can see that fire alarm has 40,000 searches a month, fire extinguisher nearly a quarter million a month. So these might be some good search terms to go after, some keywords to use on my pages, assuming that they reflect what I actually offer. The next column is competition, which is actually for the paid search side of things, not the organic side, but usually there's some pretty good overlap. And if you are gonna do paid search, the last two columns will tell you what you should plan on bidding just to get somebody to click on your link. There's also some next level tools, like I said, for agencies, things like Moz and Ahrefs uh, that I don't really have time to, SEM Rush is another one, that I don't really have time to get into today, but can, if you're interested in this, give you more data, but these are paid tools that you'll have to access. So once you've figured out what are the keyword phrases that people are most likely to search on, then it's time to start putting them onto your page. So if you're creating content, you need to think about a few key places. Remember, I told you, every offering you have deserves its own page on your website. So this is a page that's about fire alarm installation services in New York City. So that's the title of the page. This would be the big blue link on Google and you can kind of see where it's actually outside of the page, but this is one, this is the most important place to put your keywords is in that title tag. Another important place to put it is in your header and subheader tags. You can see they're doing a very good job of being consistent. You don't have to be repetitive, but consistent with some of the different phrases. There's something called semantic search. Google knows that certain phrases are connected, so you don't always have to just repeat things over and over again. And then they've also used this term in the first paragraph of their page. Those are some really good things to do. One other place you can put your keywords in is in what's called the meta description. This does not appear on the page. It doesn't even appear in the title tag, but it is often used as the one to two sentence black text underneath the blue link. And you can see here, this was their search engine result for this page. And they mentioned fire alarm and installation in New York City. So this is a page that ranks pretty well for fire installation, New York City. That's the on-page content. And yes, I can dive deeper into that, but I wanna talk also about something that a lot of people overlook, but is at least half the battle with SEO, especially in a competitive niche. And that's inbound links, links from other websites to your website. And there's a freemium tool by a company called Moz, moz.com, that will tell you how many inbound links you already have because these are pretty valuable. And I say freemium because it's free to use, but if you want all the information, then you have to pay a fee for it. 
here. I put in, uh, we'll pretend it's my uh, domain name and it tells me I've got a domain authority of 26 out of 100. That's actually not bad for your average type of business, although 30s and 40s are better and obviously more than that is fantastic. It tells me how many domains are linking to me, the number of inbound links I have, and further down the page will actually even tell me who's linking to me. This can be very valuable. It's very valuable because I can go and I can put in my competitor's website and see how I match up against them. And then I can see who's linking to them and I can send an email out to that webmaster and say, hey, I noticed you're linking to my competition. We've actually got some great resources over here, including this amazing calculator and flowchart. You might want to add that to your website so you link over to us. They may or they may not, but getting those inbound links is one of the critical ways that Google determines whether or not you have a trustworthy site. And it will definitely improve your search engine visibility. So how do you get these inbound links? Well, like I just described, one way to do it is manual outreach. It's possibly my least favorite thing to do in all of digital marketing. It is an absolute grind and I don't, it is effective, but it's time consuming. Maybe there's somebody on your team you could outsource that to. A way I prefer to do it is actually guest blogging. This is where you find blogs on the internet looking for people to supply content for them. And you write a blog post, you don't get paid for it, but you're able to link back to your website. Then you're getting, and so if you're in that industry, for the woodworking example, you find a woodworking blog, Google woodworking guest blog. You'll find woodworking blogs that are taking guest entries. You write a blog about woodworking, it links back to your website. They're happy, you're happy, everybody's happy, and you get a kick in the pants for your SEO. What I like even more these days are podcast appearances. They take a lot less work. If you can get on a podcast, usually they'll create a link in the show notes over to you and it only takes 20 or 30 minutes. It's much more time effective. If you belong to any membership organizations, chambers of commerce or professional organizations, they'll often link out to you. And there are link building agencies, although some of them are not exactly above board. So just do your due diligence before you hire out this part of the business. For many of us, we are geographically challenged in who we can do business with. And so local SEO becomes really important. And you saw my example earlier with wedding venues, and this is for fire alarm installation. And you can see here is the section where these are the local results. Unlike a, like a regular search result where there's 10 results, now there's only three. So you have to be in the top three results if you really wanna see that local traffic. Now, just in the last two weeks, they've come out with all this new research about what's working now in local SEO and it completely upended the industry. And so I actually have a podcast that's dropping tomorrow for the Agents of Change that talks about this in more detail. But the number one thing that the experts are saying that makes a difference right now is Google my business. That's not Google your business, that's Google my business, which is a service from Google and you really need to look into this. You need to claim your listing at Google My Business and invest some time and energy because this is gonna be critically important to your local search results. Getting quality and recurring reviews for your business is important. Getting links from local business is important and doing SEO around the different towns that you service on your website all impact your local SEO. Then there's paid search. Now, we're not gonna get deep into paid search because that's its own conversation, but if you're doing research into the keywords that you wanna rank well for and you see ads at the top of the page, then you have to create an ad budget for 2021. There's no two ways around it. Now you may say, well, I never click on those links. Google makes about $160 billion a year in people who do click on those links. The bottom line is, if there's ads up there, that means people have shown there's commercial intent there and your competitors are there and you need to invest some money in appearing there on those key searches. And there's some tools we use like SpyFu and lately we've actually been using more of um, WordStream. These are tools that help manage your Google ads, but you actually can just work directly with Google ads. But again, if you wanna get the most out of it, you might wanna work either with an agency who's doing this or invest in some of these agency level tools. Yes, anybody can do Google ads, just like anybody can play basketball, but only a few people are getting to the NBA. So if you wanna appear in one of those top results, you may need to really up your game there. Another place that we can drive traffic is from social media. Now, if you've not doing any social media and you don't know where your audience hangs out online, you can always find out. There's always just Google the phrase, 
uh, social media demographics 2020 or whatever year it is, and they'll tell you where your average customers are likely to hang out in social media websites. If you have a current business, you could certainly send out a quick survey and find out where people are spending their time. And you can also, if you're established, look at your Google Analytics and see what social media sites are already sending traffic to your website. And that can give you uh, some idea of where to spend time. Now, when I talk about social media, I talk about two different aspects, what I call social platforms and social networks. Social platforms are basically like standing on a soapbox. These could include things like your blog, creating videos on YouTube, creating podcasts, creating webinars. Yes, webinars can be very social. Um, and SlideShare. If you've never used SlideShare or visited the site, it's kind of like YouTube for PowerPoint presentations. These are places where I can create content, establish my expertise and credibility, and yet still get feedback from my audience, just as if you were standing on a soapbox on a public square. Some of the strategies around social media platforms are, all, first of all, it's all about content. It's all about creating content that warms clients up, that educates them, that entertains them. It's about determining what channels you want to invest in because few businesses can do a blog and a pod, podcast and a YouTube channel right out of the gate. It's about figuring out the frequency, how often you're going to be posting, how you're going to promote the content because if you're pro putting out blog posts, you can't just hope that people show up. You've got to promote them on the different social channels and through your email list. You've got to decide if you're going to monetize this in some other way than just lead generation. I know a lot of podcasters that take on sponsors so they can make money that way. And then it's about how do you take this content that you've created and repurpose it because it's very difficult and time consuming to create high quality content. So you want to think about ways that you can repurpose it. You can take a podcast, turn it into a transcript that then can be turned into a blog post. You can take a presentation you do and turn it into a series of blog posts or podcasts or social media posts. To come up with some of the ideas that you're going to need, one of the tools I recommend checking out is Google Trends, absolutely free. And you can measure different types of phrases against each other and over time. So this was one I did. You can see what's better, DIY weddings, cheap weddings, or budget weddings. Well, I certainly would hate to talk about cheap weddings, but look, that's what people are searching for. So I guess I'm going to be writing about cheap weddings rather than DIY weddings. And as I scroll down the page, Google Trends is also going to tell me about some emerging trends, which means this is content people are searching for, but maybe there's not a lot of supply out there. So this is a great opportunity for me to create content around emerging ideas. Another one of my favorite websites is Answer the Public, where I can go in and type in some keyword phrases and they show me all the different types of searches that are popular on Google right now. This is a great way to come up with new ideas for your blog or podcast or email newsletter or YouTube. Now let's shift gears quickly and talk about these social networking sites. And you know which ones I'm talking about. I'm talking about Facebook and Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Instagram, Snapchat, ran out of room, probably can include TikTok. Now, I'm not suggesting you be on all of these. Just go where your customers are. Now, there's a lot of different ways that you can regularly promote things here, but you want to take a look at when you're trying to create content for these sites is review your assets. What photos, what stories do you already have in place that you can share? You want to review your performance, and I'll show you that in a sec. And you want to develop a content calendar, which I'll show you too. So Facebook's probably the most robust for performance and, and analytics, but it can show you how you're doing and which posts on which days at which times are getting the best feedback. And you can take a look and see which ones are doing well. You can even see some other pages that you compete with and what some of their best posts are because maybe you wanna kind of take a page from their book. And you wanna develop an editorial calendar so you're not scratching your head on Monday morning being like, what am I gonna talk about this week? So we usually recommend planning out at least a month in advance on the topics you're going to be talking about. Now, that doesn't mean you can't add things as the world changes around you, but the bottom line is for your business, you should have an editorial calendar ready to go. And a lot of these platforms, either through a tool like Hootsuite or Agora Pulse or through the platform themselves like Facebook, allow you to pre-schedule some of these posts. But here's my dirty little secret. Social media does not drive a lot of traffic to most business websites. That's where social ads come in. Because these days, and especially Facebook, it's almost impossible to get any visibility for your business on those platforms without spending money. 
But social ads allow you to target people based on who they are, the demographics they're involved with. Uh, also, you can target people who have visited your website or been on your email list in the past, so you can target them further. You can set up very specific goals. Your goal may be around branding. Your goal may be around traffic to your website. Your goal could be around conversions, and you only have to pay Facebook if there's a conversion on your site. And again, this comes down to what is your customer lifetime value and what is your customer acquisition cost? Don't jump into social ads or paid ads until you figured out those numbers. Otherwise you might just be throwing money down the drain. And beyond social ads and paid ads on Google search ads, there's a lot of other advertising platforms that I've seen businesses have success on. Uh, some people hate Yelp advertising, and I'm not going to argue the point right now. It can be brutal, and um, there's a lot of history there. But TripAdvisor, House, if you're anything to do with real estate or interior decoration, House is a great platform. We have a client who's just killing it there. Uh, Spotify, Quora, Waze. Um, I didn't put this in because it's a social media, but Pinterest is another place for a lot of businesses. The promoted pins platform is fantastic. So those are some of the different ways we can attract people to our website. In the last few minutes, I just want to hit the last two and then hopefully have time for a few questions. The third letter is R for retain. And how do you stay in front of these ideal customers as they come to your website, but they're in research mode and they're looking at you and your competitors? The number one answer is email marketing. Your customer's inbox is the most valuable property on the internet and you need them to give you permission so you can market to them there. Why do I love email so much? Email is stable. Facebook and Google are constantly changing their algorithms. They're not in your business. You're basically at their mercy. Email has literally almost not changed in 20 years, except for the fact that they added images and then they started making mobile friendly because to be honest, we're all checking our email on our mobile devices. Email is intimate. Once I've sent out that blast, when people hit reply, then I can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. Email is mobile. And I'm not talking about being mobile friendly, although your, your email should be. What I mean is, if you get tired of Facebook and you're not seeing the results there anymore and you want to bring all your customers over to LinkedIn, it's not going to happen. But if you get tired of constant contact and you want to move over to MailChimp, you can take your entire email list and move it over with you because you own that email list, unlike Facebook or unlike LinkedIn. Email is unavoidable. While we're having this conversation right now, you might be missing all these Facebook posts and tweets and LinkedIn updates, but every email that got into your inbox, it's gonna be there waiting for you. You can't avoid it. And email is for selling. It is the perfect place to get people to take a buying action. So definitely you wanna leverage it. So now you're like, yeah, Rich, no, that sounds great. So how do I get more subscribers from my email list? Well, your website's going to be your number one tool to do this. And what you really want to do is you want to draw attention to that sign up box. And by the way, don't say join our mailing list. Nobody wants to join another mailing list, right? But draw attention to it. Build trust. One way you could build trust is using social proof. Join 10,000 other marketers and sign up for the Flight New Media newsletter today or whatever would be appropriate for your business. Another way you could build trust is, is there an influencer that you can reach out to that can say wonderful things about your email newsletter? Somebody who might carry some weight. So if you're doing that knitting store and there's a famous knitter who loves your stuff and would say something wonderful for you, that's well known. That could be a fantastic way to build trust too. Establish expectations. Let people know how often you're gonna be emailing them and what kind of content. Because if they're signing up because they want some tips on fashion and you start sending them a daily email on what they can buy from your online store, they're gonna get frustrated and unsubscribe. But the most important thing you can do to increase your opt-ins is to create an offer. Give them something of greater value than their email address. Now, these offers, they're a lot, it depends on your business. This is one example from Social Media Examiner, but for you, it could be a free download, or it could be a webinar. It could be a free online course. It could be a contest. It could be discounts in your online store. Whatever makes sense for you, whatever makes sense for your ideal customer, what would get them to sign up. Cheat sheets, checklists, those are all very powerful uh, downloads, by the way. 
Now, if you can't get them to sign up for your email newsletter or you're not ready to start an email newsletter, another tool you can use is called retargeting. You may have heard of the Facebook pixel. There's a pixel for every single platform out there. All this does is it lets Facebook know when somebody's visited your website. So when they go back to Facebook, if they haven't bought anything from you, you can send advertisements that show up in their newsfeed. Very powerful, very cost effective. Now, almost everything I've talked about today is about customer acquisition, but don't forget about customer retention and uh, email and retargeting are great tools for customer retention. So make sure you're spending time and budget to market to your current customers. Uh, one thing you can do is you can upsell to them. They've already seen that you're amazing. So they're more likely to buy from you. All that trust is already there. Maybe you can even earn referrals or get reviews from them. So don't forget your current customer base when it comes to marketing. And the last letter is E for evaluate. This is important. Marketers love to experiment. They love to try new things. They're not always so great at testing and seeing what's going on. The first thing you wanna figure out is what are your key performance indicators, your KPIs? What are the numbers that show that your business is heading in the right direction? Now, these may be your site traffic. It may be the number of leads you generate, or maybe the number of conversions you get. It could be your search engine rankings, your keywords, or your traffic. It could be in social media, the number of follows you have, or the engagement levels you get. For email, it could be subscribers, or more importantly, your click-through rate. And of course, it's revenue. Revenue, revenue, revenue. So what kind of tools can you use online to measure the effectiveness of your digital marketing campaigns? Everybody here who has a website should be having Google Analytics set up and you should have already connected your search console to your Google Analytics. If that hasn't happened, call up your web developer tomorrow morning or even do it tonight, she's probably awake. Tell her you need to get this installed. Those, those pieces of software are free and it's the only way you're gonna know what's going on with your website. If you wanna take things a step further, you can use a tool like Crazy Egg or Hotjar. No, I don't come up with these names, somebody else did, but these are tools that go deeper. They can show you how far down an individual page somebody scrolled, or they can show you where people are clicking on the page so you can see if they're missing your click button or if they're clicking on something that's not clickable. There's agency level uh, tools that give you even more data, and I mentioned a few of them, Moz and Ahrefs, A-H-R-E-F-S. Those are the ones that we use. Facebook and other search, uh, social media sites have their own analytics. Your email service provider, your ESP also can provide results. And there is this amazing tool called Google Data Studio that can pull in all of these reports into a dashboard for you. It takes a little while to set up, but it is brilliant once you have that set up. Now in all this, and I know I went over a lot and I know I didn't leave time for questions, but I'll stick around if people wanna ask them. There's one important thing that I left out. And this is what makes you remarkable. You can optimize your website. You can be amazing and engaging on Facebook. But if there is not something remarkable about, remarkable about your business or your message or your offering or something about you, everything falls through. If you don't have that spark of life, that's why I used Young Frankenstein. If you don't have that spark that really gets people excited, all the optimization, all the marketing in the world isn't going to move the needle for you. So going way back to what differentiates you, that is so critical and it has to be sown through every bit of your marketing online and off. That's what I had for tonight. I hope you found some of this valuable and I don't know how these things work as far as Q&A goes since I'm literally 35 seconds over, although we did start a few minutes late, but I'm certainly open to... Uh, any questions, so I'll, I'll leave it up to the moderators to figure out how they want to do this next step. Thanks everybody for paying attention.